thank uh, my turn um, Rutgers University, Simon Fraser University, uh, Dimitri Sadia Girini for their hospitality, generosity in inviting me here to Mitilini, which I, invite, uh, which I visited for the first time only last year. Um, I, uh, one, one note of apology, I, it was my, entirely my uh, fault not to uh, make the organizers aware that I'd have a, um, a PowerPoint, but the PowerPoint was, um, I only say this because uh, it was purely in my mind decorative rather than um, functional. Um, my, we can it's not. It, we'll, it's we'll it, it, it it, it, as you'll see. I don't think it's uh, uh, it, it's a problem. It's part of my uh, daughter's effort to work on my um, uh, wardrobe as well as my media presence. So um, it, it, it 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 can wait. Um, so um, I what I try to do is to bring together three strands today that. Um, respond to um, some uh, notions that I uh, project may be uh, circulating in the room amongst us. One is um, the, the, uh, to draw attention to a particular site of sovereignty, space, and aesthetics, namely islands. Second, um, in uh, uh, all sensitivity uh, for um, the ardor with which uh, Saadi Abbas has uh, mm -hmm. expressed to me her uh, relationship to the space of Molivos. Sorry. <laughs> so uh, what I try to do is to um, return after many, many years to uh, the author that I think uh, affected uh, some of this ardor, Stratis Merivilis. Actually, the other poor Merivilis was affected by the island, but I'll let you relate. Okay, well, I, I'm, I'm hoping that you'll uh, speak about Merivilis. I mentioned him only in passing, but he uh, imbues some of what uh, I'm saying. And, and also, more generally, my own relationship to the Aegean. And finally, thirdly, um, a concern for um, catastrophe and... Um, and knowing that um, Maria, who uh, follows me, uh, has written um, uh, very convincingly about um, discourses of crisis and catastrophe in Greece in the present day. I'll be speaking more about the 1920s and 1930s, um, when the word catastrophe, I think, uh, has monopolized, I think, um, the 20th century at least, uh, maybe until... Uh, the most uh, recent incarnation of uh, that word. So, um, and, and, and mindful also of the fact that I am here at the beginning of the conference, I, th I thought I'd start at the very beginning uh, by um, talking about God's intention. So on the third day, <laughs> on the third day, since we're taking things from the beginning, God <laughs> gathered the waters under the heavens in one place and let the dry land appear. God called the dry land earth, and the waters gathered together he called seas. Rumor in these parts has it that God was left with unused material, rocks, that he collected in a sieve, and just before retiring for the evening, he hurled these rocks over his shoulders into the predominating seas. And so the Greek islands were formed, thousands of them littered, or was it elegantly disposed, across the Aegean Sea, indeed across the Mediterranean. For can God, indeed the Old Testament God, really be so casual as to make a throwaway gesture? Isn't everything God does part of his grand design? Certainly his afterthought created a space for connectivity that enables multidirectional networks of interactions. In their noted book, The Corrupting Sea, A Study of Mediterranean History, Peregrine Horden and Nicholas Purcell stress the centrality of the sea to communications, to developing notions of geographical coherence and inciting civilization. Central to this endeavor was the, quote, coastwise voyage or periplus, whereby the space of the sea is conceived as a linear route defined by a sequence of harbors or natural features. At a time of rudimentary navigation, the proximity of other islands and coastline permitted exchange. 
This had led some to argue how the Greek world had no center, but rather multidirectional hubs and lines along the attendant shores, the polis, the series of polis across uh, and about the Mediterranean. This seems an intriguing prospect for thinking about geographical, ethnographic, and spatial perceptions. If one takes readings of Herodotus, there seems to be a contest between those favoring models of difference, focusing on dichotomies bet between Greeks and barbarians, a principle of alterity issuing from the Persian Wars, and pitting these against a more dialectic process born of an inter-ethnic Greek tribality that included other cultures and communities in the hinterlands. Is there a dichotomous differentiation at work between Europe and Asia, East and West, continental division, or according to the Periplus, an emphasis on the topography of the shoreline and tentative venturings to inland territories? How could we imply such hard and fast divisions when the Hellenic world stretched out in city-states and settlements that straddled both shores, Asian and European, not that far away that we can't see them from our um, delightful balconies here in the, in the rooms uh, in Molivos. The archipelago's invitation to interconnectivity stands at odds with our standard response to the notion of islands. We insist no man is an island, but what we really mean is that to begin with, every man is an island. This is neatly summarized by Gilles Deleuze in a short essay titled Desert Islands. Quote, dreaming of islands, whether with joy or in fear, it doesn't matter, is dreaming of pulling away, of being already separate, far from any continent, of being lost and alone, or it is dreaming of starting from scratch, recreating, beginning anew. Some islands drifted away from the continent but the island is also that toward which one drifts. Other islands originated in the ocean, but the island is also the origin, radical and absolute. Certainly, separating and creating are not mutually exclusive. One has to hold one's own when one is separated and had better be separate to create anew. Nevertheless, one of the two tendencies always predominates. As Deleuze explains in an article about desert islands then, it's the human being and not the island that becomes separated from the continent. Quote, an island doesn't stop being deserted simply because it's inhabited. And humans bring with them to the island the élan that produced the island as deserted, a consciousness of origin and the disposition to begin the world anew. This task is shouldered by the imagination, as islands, deserted or otherwise, are not actual. They're mythological and not geographical. For those of you traveling to Greece for the first time, it's worth pointing out that the current nation-state of Greece, established by international treaty in London in 1830, incorporated few of today's islands. In fact, it included only a few islands on Athens' doorstep, many inhabited by Albanian speakers. One critic, uh, J. Miller, 1978, has a quote I particularly like repeating. Quote, the cramped body of Hellenism lay uneasily under the, upon the Procrustean bed, which diplomacy had cynically constituted for it. So it was literally cut up and bits were thrown, thrown back. At the end of the Enlightenment, Greeks, and especially Diaspora Greeks, projected the contours of the state that would emerge upon revolution in light of the antecedent Byzantine and Ottoman empires. Superimposed on some of these projections were predictably signs of the classical Greek world too. The Ionian islands on the, off the west coast of Greece, facing, facing Italy, uh, Kefalonia, Zante, uh, Corfu, the Cyclades, the Sporides, Crete, these easternmost islands of the Aegean here were not incorporated until the 20th century. Indeed, the Dodecanese, not until 1947. From 1844 onwards, the driving ideology espoused by the Greek state was encapsulated in the Megali Idea, the great idea, that is the will to incorporate all those contiguous geographical areas inhabited by Greeks, 
or Greek-speaking Christians, whatever they might have been at this time, within the boundaries of the Greek state. This clarion call for liberation or and irredentist ideology projects a very centralized spectral economy of the area, though it radiated not only from Athens, but from Constantinople, Alexandria, the hotbeds of the diaspora in Central Europe. It's quite profitable to entertain a more decentered or islandocentric reading of the Greek state in this period, a version that would emphasize the heterogeneity of political governmental demographic forms found in clusters of islands. For example, I've been looking at the historian Sakis Gekas's book, Xenocracy, about the cluster of islands off the west coast of the Greek mainland, the Ionian Islands, following on from the Napoleonic Wars in a matter of a handful of years, they changed hands from the Russians to the French, and then the protectorate of the United States of the Ionian Islands, as they were officially called, fell entirely under the sway of the maritime Pax Britannica and were ruled over by, quote, the exclusive and immediate protection of His Majesty the King of Britain from 1815 to 1864. This was a white colony, like Malta, Gibraltar, and much later Cyprus, where the British deigned to share sovereignty and administration with island locals. Elsewhere in the Cyclades, Ottoman rule was leavened by a spotty presence on the islands. In Crete, more immediate and brutal, in the easternmost islands, handled often by Levantine figures, or I think Dimitris this morning referred, was it to the imperial intellectuals? Intermediaries. Imperial intermediaries that perhaps Barry Unsworth in Pascali's Island most famously encapsulated in the spying figure of the, of the Levantine. This all uh, engendered a kind of intellectual creolization. Inevitably, when one surveys the seas throughout this period, the narrative often demands us to gloss over the very vital differences between these island clusters as the sweep of the Megali there inexorably marched to uniting or unifying and incorporating the pillars of this periplus, Corfu, Zante, Thessaloniki, Syros, Izmir, Smyrna, and ultimately Constantinople. This project picked up speed through sacrifice, propaganda, Hellenization, and ethnic cleansing. Borders expanded through tr treaty or the spoils of war, and led us to the climax of the Megali there. It is here in these islands that Greek troops organized and stepped off on the quay in Izmir, in Smyrna, in Asia Minor in 1919. It's here three years later that they fled in defeat in what came to be known as the Asia Minor catastrophe. Alongside them, between a million and a million and a half Greek refugees, Christian refugees of Greek consciousness, more or less, swarmed west, many to the islands of the eastern Aegean, uh, Aegean and many more here to Mytilini. What was it like to stand here in 1922-1923? Where does one go from here? Deleuze exhorts, quote, to get back to the movement of the imagination that makes the deserted island a model, a prototype of the collective soul. For, he elaborates, the deserted island is not creation, but recreation. Not the beginning, but a re-beginning that takes place. The, desert, the deserted island is the origin, but a second origin. From it, everything begins anew. The island is the necessary minimum for this re-beginning, the material that survives the first origin, the radiating seed or egg that must be sufficient to reproduce everything. Deleuze's general reflections are instructive. The world is reformed in processes of birth and rebirth whereby the second rebirth is necessary because the first is compromised. It is due renewal, renewal, always on the heels of catastrophe. Quote, it's not that there is a second birth because there's been a catastrophe, but the reverse. There's a catastrophe after the origin because there must be from the beginning a second birth. I like his idea of a second birth. It's more essential as it marks a repetition and institutes a mythology which is entrusted not to the gods, but to man. And the example he gives 
is, of course, from the myth of the flood and the notion of Noah and the ark resting on a mountain, which then eventually becomes an island as, as the waters recede. The ark sets down on the one place on earth that remains uncovered by water, a circular and sacred place from which the world begins anew. The island or mountain, the egg, the cosmic egg, with this mythological maternity, Deleuze sees as a sacred place, and, and it's a place that is slow to rebegin. So, approaching the space of Midilini through literature, we bear some of these ideas in mind. No doubt we're all painfully aware of the influx of um, refugees, of migrants, NGOs, tourists, traffickers, uh, who've come to the island in a time of national, economic, moral, shall we say, recalibration. Those who've come to see for themselves, to lend a helping hand, or merely to take selfies and insinuate themselves into history in the making. There's a sense by which one comes to stand over this cultural limit, this cut in the landscape, that marks, if not quite a global scene, then certainly a cut through the heart of Europe, just like Lampedusa or areas of Spain. In this context, a dichotomous logic is imposed from outside on the channel here that separates Greece from Turkey, Europe from Asia, Christian from Muslim, the European Re Union from the rest. In the terms or logics of the Periplus, the experience of fleeing war to the east is also known to the inhabitants of these islands, whose own family histories share affinities with the new refugees' plight. After all, family members in living memory themselves fled a blessed place, a place of bereket, a Turkish word that combines the meaning of abundance and fruitfulness with divine blessing. The original sin of Christian and Muslims alike in Asia Minor was to doubt that such plenitude, mythical plenitude, could satisfy everyone's needs and desires. Now the experience of exile and homelessness resonate deep in the soul. Indeed, history often bears haunting witness to past traumatic dispossessions. A recent bulletin of the UNHCR focused on one Ahmed Tarzalakis, a Syrian refugee from Al Hamidiya, a town close to Syria's border with Lebanon, Lebanon originally settled by refugees fleeing from the Greco-Turkish War of 1897. During the course of the current Syrian civil war, Ahmed crossed with his family over to Lesbos and eventually continued his journey to settle on the island of Crete. There, this refugee with the pleasantly syncretic name returned to the home of his ancestors, Greek-speaking Cretan Muslims, who had fled Crete in 1897 in the aftermath of that, the earlier Greco-Turkish war to the one of 1922. Now returning to the scene of initial trauma, deracination, and displacement, Ahmed's search for hope and restitution marks the curious, gyre-like returns of history. To reflect on such ironies of history in the present and from here, one certainly could look back to the local literary record from that period for instruction, but also for a recasting of the mythology. I will allude, allude very briefly to three male authors each returning from war to the island or islands in the search of rebirth. The Nobel laureate poet Odysseus Elitis, the novelist Stratis Medivilis, and the short story writer Elias Venezis. Elitis, probably the best known to you, Nobel Prize uh, laureate in poetry in 1979, fought on the Albanian front against the Italians in 1940. Mirivilis had seen service in Asia Minor, as had Venezis. The former two were born in uh, Mitilini. Venezis was born in Aivali, or Aivalik, on the Anatolian coast in 1904, just across the way. During World War I, Venezis's family sought refuge on the island of Lesbos at the end of World War I, Venezis returned to Asia Minor only to experience firsthand the events of 1922 when he was captured by Turkish forces and sent on a forced inland march to a labor camp. Of the 3,000 Christians forced on this march, Venezis was one of only 23 who lived to tell the tale, 
and to be reunited with his family in Mytilene in late 1923. In shorthand, if we recognize the mythology of the Aegean in the pages of uh, our flight brochure, uh, flying here from Athens, this is perhaps in due to the popularization of Elitis, the poet's mythologization of the Aegean, and I know Irini will be speaking about the Aegean tomorrow. From his first collection of poetry, Elitis announces an orientation to the East by conferring upon it that title, a word which, once broken down, gives us the word toward the East. Situated within the islands, Elitis would claim an imaginative space not in the exotic East of Rebetica, of modern Turkey, etc., but certainly East of urbanizing Athens, away from classical Greece. Behind him, a godless theological belief in redemption or ap apocatastasis of fallen matter, which is actually an orthodox um, uh, doctrine about the restitution of matter in, uh, in heaven or in a redemptive state. Be this matter cleansed in Hellenism or the divine, it regenerates the East and it willfully charts a course that represses or sidesteps any kind of present Turkish element or borrowing. Elitis' Aegean in poetic time and narrative history forms a new collective unconscious, a displaced trip and wish fulfillment for that which we couldn't have, a Greek Constantinople, the poetic and imagined completion of the Megalia Idea, the great idea. After 1922, Constantinople still remains, the topos of a Greek loss and not a Turkish present. This typology has been sub subsequently reproduced in the Greek unconscious. In a Greek Cypriot loss and not a Turkish Cypriot presence, in the belief in a northern Epirus and not a southern Albania, in, in the reticence to uh, recognize a northern Macedonia uh, and not... Um, uh, the idea of um, a larger Macedonian space. But above all and principally, Constantinople's cartographic displacement to the Aegean fetishizes the space and fills as well as marks the original scene of trauma in the hope that eventually, I'm quoting Elitis, the sea which possesses all the values of the Aegean world will take its vengeance. And that vengeance, I would argue, he takes primarily in very male and sexual terms. In one of his last ruminations, Elitis declares, you know, you go home quicker by way of Constantinople. Moving on to this issue of loss, I want to look at it uh, just briefly uh, by touching upon it in uh, Mirivilis's uh, novel, um, not Sadia's Mermaid Madonna, but uh, the schoolmistress with the golden eyes. That's mine, Sue. Huh? That's yours too? Okay, lay claim to it. I, I, I don't lay claim to it. I've, I, I return to I it. Mean, if we are. I've returned to it. Uh, right? I, would argue, I would argue that uh, a lot of the, um, a lot of the uh, tension and the anxiety in the novel uh, is located in the, um, in the Turkish hinterland, in a town uh, known as uh, Eski Sehir, which is where all the trains in Turkey meet right in the middle of the country, but it's also the real turning point for the Greek campaign in Turkey. It's the moment where the Greek uh, forces are defeated and slowly then um, uh, flee back in this direction to the west and then uh, away. It's here in uh, Eski Sehir that a leg is amputated in the story, um, the amputation of a leg uh, by a soldier. So again, I'm cutting things, cutting things up again. Uh, on this kind of Procrustean uh, bread of um, a lost. Uh, the pro protagonist uh, sees a, a, a companion uh, have his um, leg amputated and the rest of the novel to a certain degree uh, compensates for this, if you like, castration of um, uh, the Greek uh, male presence. Um, and uh, much of this is, uh, is done uh, in, in relation to the fallen hero's uh, wife in uh, Mytilini, here in uh, Mytilini, um, uh, where the protagonist attempts uh, 
uh, against all odds um, the, with um, uh, uh, a number of impediments, let's say, to uh, eventually uh, reinvest uh, something of uh, his own um, male uh, sexual uh, desire, uh, literally to, to remember, to remember what that was, what that had been lost uh, in these terms. And I, 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 here I don't really use the word um, lightly uh, or as a kind of um, punning turn of phrase, but um, as a very key element of um, this whole poetics. Uh, I'm not going to focus in on uh, so much uh, on this particular work by Mirivilis, but look at it um, through uh, another work that I'd been working on uh, last year when I first came to um, Mitilini, uh, Elias Venezis' uh, relatively unknown uh, short story called The Islet of Jos from a collection of 1928, which may, may very well be one of the first refugee short stories. And in fact, looking back from 1940, an eminent critic um, uh, termed it uh, as such. Um, this is another uh, tale which deals with amputation. And um, it's, um, it's a story that um, uh, has been overshadowed, I think, by Venezis's other works. Venezis is known very much as the author who um, treats the uh, gradual settlement uh, and reorientation of refugees from Asia Minor to the uh, Greek mainland and to the Greek islands. Um, but um, there are a number of reasons for focusing uh, on, on, on this story. Um, it engages, it seems to me, the trauma of these events with the visceral frisson of almost fingernails reaching down a, a blackboard. Uh, Venezis focuses, in fact, on a tattoo which is etched on the amputated arm of his protagonist. Protagonist is known as the bat uh, in reference to one of these tattoos. Uh, and he has lost his hand to Turkish troops on a small islet, Lyos, which is a, a barren isle just off the coast here. Um, and despite this loss, which is again a kind of unmanning of sorts, he prides himself on the fact that he was the only Greek to survive the incident at the hands of the Turks and defiantly claims that it does not hinder him from doing anything he wishes, even from participating in subsequent compensatory violent acts against the Turks. In this story, this ghostly missing hand is the embodiment of or pivot for a series of other losses, scarcities, and aggressions. For the bat is a refugee, and when he and other fishermen are forbidden by the Turks from fishing in the teeming waters of their lost homeland, their poverty drives them to defy the order and court further danger. Like the repetitive piercing of a tattoo, multiple forms of trauma are layered and interimplicated so that the hand recalls what's been lost and can never be made whole again. Alongside this painful self-inscription and defiant remembrance of trauma comes a moment of recognition that the other, the enemy, has been inflicted and, and, and also received pain and dispossession. The story stages the traumatic return as it inscribes itself on the region. The bat will eventually confront the source of his trauma, and the story also dissects the category crisis brought on by the uncanny effect of population exchanges at Europe's periphery almost a century ago. In the story, Muslim Turks from Crete are expulsed from the Greek mainland and now are resident in Turkey. They hold the bat, a Christian Greek from Turkey, exiled to the Greek island of Metellini hostage. Sworn enemies share mutual dispossession. Their meeting, at which each speaks the other's language, is staged in the presence of a gun-toting Turkish conscript for the easternmost provinces of Turkey in Diyarbakir. Not invested in the passions of Greek and Turkish Anatolians, the soldier is reluctantly serving his service far away from home. Yet he is himself from a province we know today to be a capital of Kurdish presence in Turkey. And in the late 19th century, a site of several massacres perpetrated against Armenian and Syriac Christians. 
like the equally dull-witted soldier in Kafka's penal colony, colony, he knows only how to carry out his duty, to hold his prisoner captive and follow orders, if necessary to execute a man, even though all he really wants deep down is to go home. However, at the end, he doesn't execute his orders, and he decides, looking at, down at the barrel of a gun at our protagonist, to shoot a seagull instead. So how do we remember these fundamental loss losses, the story asks? Are there ways of moving beyond stories of completion and revenge that provide the imaginative space for empathy and forgiveness? The story, however, does not rest or end with this seeming identification. It actually moves on to a much more grotesque ending. And I think there is a kind of grotesquery also both to Elitis's poetry, for all its charm, and the ending, the, the most, perhaps some of the most purple passages of prose at the end of Mirivilis's yeah. last chapter of The Mermaid Madonna, the grotesquerie that comes with what Sadia has referred to as the ekphrastic license of those passages. So in a maelstrom of tangled feelings after this scene of escape from Turkey, the protagonist in this Venezia story is depicted confronting his twisted tattoos. The bat's body with lions caught in stifling serpent's embrace with a hovering bat gazing impassively on returns to Mitilini. And there the bat resolves to inscribe the anguish of his later encounter on his body. Quote, he started to turn up the sleeve over his good arm, and then he paused. A sudden amusing thought occurred to him. No, there was a mermaid on his good arm already. He didn't need a mermaid. He ought to tattoo the other one, the severed arm. He smiled. Yes, the other arm. He always had it wrapped as if swaddled. First he loosened the ties and then unbound them. A lump of flinch like a dead thing, a nothing. The cut was a mass of puckers and wrinkles like the skin on an ancient face, unquote. Then later, he almost choked on his words, struggled to get them out, but he did in the end. The others stared at him, surprised, the snakes, the bat, and now a seagull. Oh, brother, ashamed, he lowered his glowing eyes to the ground like a girl. The blood from the needles trickled into the fine folds of flesh, that made his wound resembled a small wizened face. And there appeared a seagull, or something like that, a few thick, crass lines mingled with trickling blood, the soot of incense and raki. From now on, the snakes, the mermaid, the bat, and the lion would have another frightened companion, a bird, that bat. He did not show any pain. He was happy. He did not feel a thing, for he was whistling. The conceptual framework emanating from this periplus back to the catastrophe of 1922 would seem less to suggest the mythological maternity of uh, Deleuze's projection than a reinvigorated, often violent male desire. I leave it to others uh, to consider a little bit um, any lines of comparison with uh, the current uh, crisis or the discourse of crisis in the ways in which this might engage, as others have engaged, notions of family, notions of threatened masculinity, particularly in film, gendered ambiguity, or, uh, and also the issues of uh, work and service, which have been um, uh, uh, reconsidered in the last uh, 10 or 12 years, mostly, of course, in the urban context and not so much in, in the islands. Um, what does it mean to come back to the island home and read meaning into it? I'm reminded a little bit, standing on the balcony over this kind of cut of civilization, of the Greek poet George Seferis, um, who um, was from uh, just across the way uh, in Izmir, and a poem that he wrote uh, on the eve of his return to Greece in 1944 on the Italian coast, returning with the Greek government in exile 
uh, after the period of the war years as he looks over uh, to the Greek mainland. And he writes at the Cava di Tirreni um, with, a, with a speaker who stands out ready to return, quote, the same thing over and over again, you tell me, friend. But the thinking of a refugee, the thinking of a prisoner, the thinking of a person, when he too has become a commodity, try to change it, you can't. And so Seferis talks in fables and parables about the horror. It's more gentle that way, he says. In many ways, he anticipates a commodification of persons that is becoming transactional as much at the micro level as between states, return of migrants in exchange for concessions on trade or economic support, as affected in recent days between the United States and Mexico, or before, uh, before here, between the EU and Turkey to facilitate the deportation of asylum seekers, migrants, back across the divide. In many ways, the EU-Turkey pact added one more dimension to a growing sea-oriented definition of sovereignty in Greece. That is to say, I argued in my last book, The Balkan Prospect, that issues of identity, citizenship, difference, rights in Greece from 1989 onwards had often been defined up until just before the beginning of what we refer to as the crisis, um, had been defined in relation to a Balkan dimension. This manifested itself externally in the challenge posed by Greece's potential role in incorporating other Balkan states and peoples into Europe, and no less internally by coping with the flux of Balkan migrants into Greece throughout the 1990s and post-2004 Olympics. Some of the marquee controversies of this period often focused on contact zones with Balkan significance. And yet, just before the onset of the crisis, migration flows changed and saw a new wave from Africa and the Middle East, even as the country's economic woes obliged, obliged some of these migrants, these very Balkan migrants, back to their home countries in search of employment and better life. Soon Greece was one of the pigs, geographically located in the Mediterranean again, oriented by sea and not by land, its borders threatened by a wave of migration around borders policed by Frontex, and increasingly in waters explored by foreign multinational gas and oil conglomerates that reorient and grant primacy to political solidarities and environmental priorities with the USA, Israel, Sisi's Egypt, and not Turkey, or for that matter, the Turkish Cypriots. The catastrophe seems always already to be just around the corner. Thank you.